we are all as a species in the midst of a crisis of our minds, of our thinking, um, broadly defined, um, cognition broadly defined here. So our attention, our memory, our perceptual abilities, our decision making, our imagination and creativity, our emotional regulation, our empathy, our compassion, just the whole broad scope of how we work and function, I think is not up to the task of living in this complex planet and you know this world that we have created, the human um, interconnected high tech world, and that we are paying a big price for that. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number one hundred and seventy nine, and this episode is with Adam Gitzali who is David Dolby Distinguished Professor of Neurology, Physiology, and Psychiatry in the School of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. And Adam has one of the coolest gigs in academia that I've encountered, which is a niche that he seems to have really just made for himself, as so much of his work, as you'll hear, uh, is quite groundbreaking. But in general, he focuses on developing new approaches to both assess and then optimize human cognition. And he pays particular attention to underutilized but high potential tools like video games. Though he's thinking about all sorts of things from psychedelics to sensory isolation. And in this episode, we discuss all these things as they relate to what Adam has dubbed the cognition crisis, which I won't say too much more about now since we get into it right at the beginning of the episodes, episode, but it's the fact that our brains seem to be under a ton of stress in this modern, connected, tech-dependent age. So we get into the structural features of the brain, the effects of the current environment upon it, and then how we can make use of its plasticity with tools. I mean, with tools, we can make use of its plasticity to optimize performance in far from optimal circumstances. So you should check out Adam's book, The Distracted Mind, and then please leave reviews, comments, likes, subscribes. All of these are endlessly appreciated. And then, as you know, there is RobinsonsFashionEmpire.com, which has plenty of Robinson's podcast related and semi-related t-shirts. So without any further ado, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Adam. When I look at all of the things you've accomplished in your career as a neuroscientist, your your CV is quite long. I, I see two broad components. So one consisting of research that's geared toward understanding various dimensions of brain plasticity. And then another wing consisting of the development of interventions to control those changes. And And first, I should just ask if you think that's close to the mark, and then second, more more substantively, is this duality of understanding and intervention what you always plan to explore going into neuroscience, or did it just happen by chance? Great questions. Core to me, um, and so I, I love uh, exploring this. I always, growing up, I'll back it up a bit, I always wanted to do something in my life to help people. Um, and that is why I did an MD and a PhD route. I wanted to always um, aspire to do things that were intellectually stimulating, but also contribute to you know the future of our species on this planet. As audacious as that sounds, I've sort of always been like that. And I, you know, figured like many young people that the route to do that is through science and understanding how our brains and bodies work. Um, and so that's what I did. I, you know, my PhD was, was in neuroscience and <clears throat> I was always inherently attracted to plasticity in the brain since the nineties when I started my graduate school work. And it carried through to my transition from animal neuroscience, uh, under the microscope to human based research using imaging and 
uh, tools of, of uh, cognitive neuroscience. And so I had spent most of my life trying to understand how the brain works, how the brain changes, what are the um, vulnerabilities of the brain in terms of how we interact with our environment, how does it change with aging. This is what more than 50% of my publications uh, focus on. And then, um, I guess it's been around 12 years ago, I sort of got disillusioned and felt that maybe I was lost in some way. And some of it was coupled with not just the feeling of disillusionment, but frustration that what I was doing, as interesting as it was to me and clearly to journals and grants, like I was doing fine as a scientist, wasn't likely going to actually help anyone in their lives. And I sort of went back to my roots and said, that's why I entered uh, science and medicine in the first place. And so I wouldn't call it a pivot because I, a lot of the work I do is still directed at understanding the brain and plasticity at a fundamental level. But it was a big expansion of my research focus um, to say, okay, let's use the methodology of neuroscience and let's try to accomplish two goals, two bottom lines. Let's learn about the brain, but always in the context of how we can improve brain function to help people have better brains and better lives. And so that's why you see that um, in my my list of publications is because starting around 13, maybe even 15 years ago as, a, as an idea, I decided that I didn't want to do neuroscience for the sake of neuroscience anymore. I want to do neuroscience for really accomplishing what I think people mean or should mean when they say translation, translating it from science into people's lives. And so I wouldn't say I, I pre-calculated, certainly have not pre-calculated what I have become and my group has become and the work we do, but I sort of am now in a comfortable position in my life that I feel that what I spend my time on from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep is is in alignment with my life goals of doing science, but with the vision that it will help people. That's awesome. And I have tons of questions, but it's a, so it's a good reason that, I mean, it's a good thing that we're talking, but just to start off again, I mean, what is it about brain plasticity that always interested you so much? And I guess I threw in a technical term right off the bat in that first question. I mean, plasticity. So how do you think of it? What is it? Yeah. I mean, plasticity is the ability of our brain to constantly modify itself. There's different stimuli, both experience and damage that can lead to plasticity. But what plasticity itself is, is this dynamic process of the brain adapting at every level, structure of the brain, chemistry, physiology, and other functional aspects. Um, and so it's constantly changing. And that is a core principle of modern day neuroscience. It wasn't always appreciated. And when it was appreciated, it was always thought to be something that occurred up until critical stages of development and then essentially stopped, which sort of made no sense because we know we're capable of learning throughout our lives. And so it is the basis of all learning. Um, it is the basis of any recovery and repair. And so I was attracted to it from that perspective that it is just so core to our function to be human is that we evolve in our own personal ways, not in the big evolution way, but we have our own development that exists and continues throughout our lives. And so this is the opportunity to change and to grow and to be resilient. And then just from an sort of intellectual scientific point of view, it's just infinitely interesting to me that it is not a static process. It's our brain, our mind, that it is a dynamic, constantly interactive um, feature of this system that uh, that is just so fascinating. And not only that, that it is not taking place in isolation. It's not something that your brain does as an island. It is an interaction with the environment. And that is sort of where I think the mind lives really at that interface. And so plasticity is just core to all of that. Mm -hmm. This notion of plasticity as the capacity for dynamic change across structural, chemical, physiological components. I'm really interested to hear 
what the limits of this are and we'll get to it just because just to, just to fill you in on on where I am in the the podcast I've had a few conversations recently with um a personality psychologist uh a neuroscientist who studies intelligence and then uh a behavioral geneticist all three of whom I got the sense from that they see serious limits on brain plasticity in terms of how much our personalities can change, how much our intelligence can change. And from the, the, the standpoint of the behavioral geneticist, who is a pretty hard line genetic determinist, I'd say, the extent to which any of our behaviors can change. So I'll, I'll be really curious to hear where you weigh in on this. But first, another thing that you said is, what you're interested in doing now is using the methodology of neuroscience to one, understand the brain and two, to improve the brain and setting aside for the moment, the fact that we might have the tools to change the brain. Now, why is now the current time, a particularly important period to be concerned about brain plasticity and the possibility for change? And this means, uh, let me put it a different way. What is the cognition crisis? Perfect segue. I love it. Um, it it it, it, it connects to really fundamental uh, aspects of my life that that I think about and write about, and I'm glad that you put it together so eloquently. It, it saved me having to make that bridge. But um, you know, let's talk about my view on the cognition crisis, and then we'll create a, a, a nice connection between what we just talked about and plasticity. But my view of the cognition crisis is uh, based, that's the title of the piece I wrote several years ago. It was a follow up in many ways to a book I wrote called The Distracted Mind. Um, the cognition crisis is a much bigger story than what I cover in The Distracted Mind. Um, and it's really meant to, in some ways, be a counterbalance to this term that we hear a lot about, like mental health crisis. And I think when people talk about a mental health crisis, as far as I can tell from reading as much as I can about it, they're talking about something that's very real, very tragic, and very you know timely in that there's incredible suffering going on around the world, people that are debilitated by all sorts of impairments of their brains and their minds from emotional regulation, depression, anxiety, stress, um, dementia, and seniors. Um, attention deficit disorder. Um, and it is something that has been going on for a long time and has gotten worse. Suicide, depression in teens has increased. Dementia continues to increase as our aging population increases. And so, yeah, that's very real. It's very global. And it's a really important point um, and something that we need to address. The cognition crisis idea was my attempt to say, that is not the full problem, <laughs> that the problem extends beyond people who have clinical diagnoses, that we are all as a species in the midst of a crisis of our minds, of our thinking, um, broadly defined, um, cognition broadly defined here. So our attention, our memory, our perceptual abilities, our decision making, our imagination and creativity, our emotional regulation, our empathy, our compassion, just the whole broad scope of how we work and function, I think is not up to the task of living in this complex planet and, you know, this world that we have created, the human um, interconnected high tech world, and that we are paying a big price for that. Um, and in terms of not just the mental health crisis, which is part of that but all of us need to have better sustained attention, better long-term thinking, more empathic concern for each other, and that you can see the symptoms of this crisis literally just by reading the news. And that's incredibly timely right now. The news is seems like it's worse every single month. I mean, it's almost unreadable as far as I'm concerned, um, especially just this last week. But it's just um, it's something that really concerns me. And that's why I feel like the mental health crisis, not to diminish it, is really just a piece of what's going on right now and that we're all in needs of up leveling our minds uh, so that we can live on this planet the the other reason why i sort of place it as a crisis is because the other very real crises um equality 
climate change, biodiversity, you know, there's a long list. This, you could look up on uh, on any search engine, what are the big global challenges that we face? And you will find, you know, water, this list of things, infectious disease as well. Nowhere do you see that we have a crisis or a grand challenge to help improve our minds. Uh, maybe a mention of drug addiction here and there or suicide, but not how I'm talking about it, which is just all of our function. And I would say that it's this crisis of our cognition that prevents us from solving any of the other crises. Yeah. So it's sort of like the, if we can't fix this, mm -hmm. we cannot address climate change. I would be so bold to say that. Like we already know about a lot about climate change. I feel like we keep seeing the same report every five years. We even know how we can address it. But something prevents us from doing that. And it's not a technical problem and it's not a scientific problem. It's a problem of our thinking and our minds. And until we address that, we will constantly have this challenge and we will threaten our life on this planet. So that's sort of the cognition crisis idea. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, there are other components to it, like like political infighting that prevent solving the climate change. But I'm, I'm with you 100% that just one component of the cognition crisis, this deficit in long-term planning uh, ability uh, needs to be addressed. So it's still, it's still a crucial point, but it's, it's just not. For, the, for the sure. Not and I would say like, I'd say a lot of the political infighting is also related to the cognition crisis. Like if, if our systems of government and policy creation are not built on the fundamentals of empathic concern, long-term decision-making love, <laughs> then yeah, of course the political systems are broken. So I think it's even foundational to that, um, that process as well. I'm not saying that it'll fix it. I mean, there are, the systems are deeply, you know, rooted in, um, policies and, and structure that needs to completely be revamped. But I still think at the core of it is that we're just not thinking the way we need to, to be able to manage global societies the way it exists now. Absolutely. Capacious thought is the only thing that will get us out of all these problems that we're facing. So one cause that you mentioned in this piece of, and I think you might have also just mentioned it, of the cognition crisis is longer lifespans. So for instance, with longer lifespans, you're going to have more impairment in cognition, more dementia, things like that. But, and, the, and that's not too mysterious, but how is it that, or why is it, or how is it that increase, increased use or consumption of information technology could be having these negative effects on our cognition? Yeah, that's a, another great and big question. That was sort of the focus of my book with, with Larry Rose and the Distracted Mind, which is subtitles, Ancient Brains in a High-Tech World. And really the thesis is that our brains evolved in a certain condition to accomplish a certain, you know, I mean, not, not teleologically speaking, but it was sort of evolved to for survival. And um, our brains are essentially perception action machines. They perceive the world and now uh, allowing us to respond in some way. And those ways, um, when it's related to survival, are reproduction, finding food, avoiding toxins. And our brains still largely work that way as well. Um, now our brains live in a very different world. And especially how technology, mostly I would refer to having a very high speed, powerful computer in your pocket that has communication networks with the rest of the world instantaneously, um, which almost, you know, most people in the world will have that very soon if, if most have it right now, that that creates a pressure on our brains that we did not have before. And that our ancient brains, and much of our brain is still the same brain that it was during our evolutionary development, that that pressure creates all sorts of chaos and consequences in our behavior and how we live in this world and impairments on our cognition, fragmented attention, very high rates of re reward in very short periods of time of the opportunity to fragment your attention through multitasking, the unfortunate ability to know what's going on 
around you with all your friends when you're not there, things, you know, even things of that nature really have an impact on us. And we did not develop our technology in a thoughtful way, nor did we build in monitoring systems to understand what the negative consequences were going to be. And so a lot of the cognition crisis now, I feel is aggravated by modern day technology. Some of it exists just because we're older, we're, we're living longer and, and you know, all systems uh, change with age, but, and the brain is not uh, exempt from that. But I think that you see the real pressure of technology even exaggerated in older adults and children and adolescents and in clinical populations. Hmm. One thing that you said that stuck out to me is high rates of reward and having this high speed communication device um, in our pockets. In the past month or two, I've been keeping my phone on airplane mode all day and until maybe like 7 or 8 p.m. in the evening. And I've just noticed that I feel so much better. And I wonder, this is totally uh, not a scientific statement, but just as the phone comes with high rates of reward, like when you see a, a funny meme or something like that, there's also high rates of quote unquote punishment. Like when I look at uh, podcast reviews and maybe there's a bad one, something like this, it's happening all the time. And just as a car wears down uh, from lots of bumps on the road, I imagine that this constant up and down in the brain causes chaos. 100%. It causes chaos in all sorts of ways from emotional regulation to stress and anxiety, impacting sleep, uh, fragmentation of attention in general, um, driving more short-term decision-making. I mean, the whole changes in how we feel empathy and compassion to each other. It's all out there and documented in all sorts of ways in different populations. And so that's, that's real. And, you know, I mean, sometimes I just try to imagine what and I have children now, so it's easier of what it's like growing up in a world where all of this communication and pictures of everything are just always distributed. Like I didn't grow up in that world. It's it's hard to manage as an adult, but with a developing young adolescent brain, it's it's almost inconceivable to me. And I've been studying this for 30 years and it's still mind blowing of how does anyone manage to health, you know, navigate in a healthy way through adolescence in the system that us, you know, we have built for them. Hmm. Well, just to make this a bit more concrete, since I was speaking quite loosely with my um, analogy to a car, where do specific brain regions, like uh, one that you write about often is the prefrontal cortex, uh, where do they figure into this problem? How can we make it more concrete what's happening in our brains? Yeah. So one of the areas of research that um, was a big focus of mine up until, I mean, it's still in my research program, but as we talked about, I'm much more focused on intervention and trying to build tools to help improve brain function. But the area where I spent a decade focusing on was how does our brain manage interference, which is part of the conversation we're just having. How do you deal with distraction? Irrelevant information that's presented around you, multiple screens, text coming in, you know, all the things that are outside of your goals. How does our brain also deal with another type of interference, which is multitasking? Um, so that's different than distraction in my work. Distraction is information that you're actually trying to suppress that's in interfering with your goal. Multitasking is when you make the decision not to suppress that and try to do more than one thing at a time. Both of these are types of interference that my work and as well as many others all converge to show that our brains just don't do very well with interference. It degrades our performance and it causes all sorts of downstream consequences on behavior, which is sort of what we were talking about. But if you go back to the neuroscience, which is where I started all of this, you look at the brains of people that are confronted with interference, whether distraction or multitasking while you're imaging their brain, either with fMRI or EEG, which is the tools that I use the most. And you see the interference occur. Um, you can see that neural networks that are directed 
at a particular goal involve the prefrontal cortex, so the front part of our brain, the most evolved part of our brain, also the part of our brain that takes the longest to develop across the human lifespan, that that part of the brain, and I'm simplifying because there are many areas of the prefrontal cortex, but that area communicates with other parts of the brain, like the hippocampus involving memory, the amygdala for emotional processing, visual areas, auditory areas, and those large scale networks are what allow you to focus and to engage on something. But when you have to engage on something else, whether you are pulled away to it involuntarily by a distracting force or whether you voluntarily decide to do something, you don't parallel process in the way that we think of that word. You don't just start another network without this one suffering no decrement. You basically switch. And so in the brain, you see switching of networks. This is what we and others have seen. And with each switch, there's a cost. There's some degradation of the information and the processing that you can pick up um, even at a performance level, even at from memory to perceptual processing to other attentional metrics. You can see this cost of being um, of switching between networks. And so that is what occurs uh, in an acute level. If you do that all the time, there is limited data, but the speculation that it becomes how your brain, it's sort of the default of how your brain operates. But because the brain is plastic, sort of connecting to our earlier conversation, it can be corrected, right? The brain can be put into a different state of engagement, a different default of how it tends to engage in the environment. But that's the work that I've done on how the prefrontal cortex, sort of the control center of the brain, how it processes goal-directed information and how interference then degrades that process. Hmm. And just to, to finish this up, maybe hopefully summarize and try try something together, is the main thread in the neurological side of the story of the cognitious crisis, cognition crisis that even though problems might arise uh, in emotional regulation, maybe specific to the amygdala, for instance, the main overriding problem is in the frontal prefrontal cortex uh, and that's my thesis. Um, but, you know, I see it through my lens. So the cognition crisis was, and, and that piece, and when I talk about that, it was not meant to place an overemphasis on sort of the neuroscience of it, but just sort of phenomenologically, this is an observation that I don't see talked about a lot, and I don't see sort of addressed at the level of the UN and other global initiatives that, wow, we need to have better brains, like just all of us, like we need to level it up because we're struggling. That's sort of what that piece was about from a practical perspective of how do you solve that to, you know, so many ways and none of them are, are, you know, many of them are right. Let's say maybe some of them are wrong, but many of them are right. My particular focus is on prefrontal cortical function and attention as a foundational ability that we have selective and sustained attention in a top down manner that I see as a sort of basement level, a foundation upon which all those other aspects of cognition rest. That if the, if the attentional framework is not strong and established, that it impacts how we perceive, how we feel, how we think, how we imagine, and we can't correct it if we don't build better attentional systems. So that is, you know, the, the sort of connecting piece between the cognition price uh, crisis uh, message, which is like, whoa, this is so big right now and it affects all of us. Why are we not talking about this all the time? And why do we not have big global initiatives to address it? And then how we can is by improving attention as one of the ways. And how do we improve attention is because our brains are plastic and we have not really thought deeply and put enough resources into how we can harness our brain's plasticity maximally to improve our attention and then lead to better cognition. Mm. And speaking of these big global initiatives and of the UN and other large bodies, government, education, the medical establishment, without getting into the specifics yet of particular treatments, which 
I think will be one component of this. What are the sorts of ways in which these organizations need to adapt to adequately combat this crisis? What are the sorts of global initiatives? It's a it's a great question. This one's a little outside of my lane, in all honesty. I, I like to think as big as I can, but I also know my limitations and sort of global policy making and, and at this level is really beyond the, the, the details I, I have in terms of implementing it. My sort of my my goal here is to ring a bell, say this is a bigger problem than mental health. Um, and that we need to put it on a list as a start. <laughs> because if you search for all these global initiatives and these big global challenges, it's not on the list. Um, and so it's clearly not in people's consciousness and the decision makers that we have a cognition crisis, that our climate change and biodiversity crisis that is real is unaddressable in a meaningful and sustainable way. If we don't deal with the fact that we can't sustain our attention, that we can't make long-term decisions, that we don't feel enough empathy for each other and for nature. And so my, my first sort of mission was, wow, wouldn't it be great if this was at least on a list somewhere? I have never seen this really prioritized as a grand challenge. And then how do you implement this um, in a way that's actionable that leads to that change is such a bigger question um, that I don't I don't certainly have all the answers. My my own focus has been to develop technologies uh, to address that, but it is way bigger than that. Okay, and before we get into the technologies and the intervention, I'd like to understand just a little bit better the research on brain plasticity, uh, which in some of your writing writing you've you've likened to, at least in some dimensions, to the plasticity of physical fitness, which can improve or deteriorate based on use or abuse. And getting back just briefly to those conversations I mentioned having, particularly with a behavioral geneticist and uh, another neuroscientist, this is somewhat of a controversial topic, but the consensus I received from the two of them is that intelligence is one cognitive dimension that is not plastic. But I understand that you have a, a different interpretation of the research, or maybe it's a different dimension of intelligence that you're concerned with. Yeah. So this, this is complicated. I'm going to try to be precise in my language here and not step into too many uh, pits. But um, first I would, I, my, my first question would be like, well, how do you, how does anyone know that? Like, how, have we, have we really managed to do all the research to push plasticity to its limits and just found out where those limits are? That would be my first question. Like, how do, how do we know that? I have not been convinced by anything I read that, that sh convinces me that that study, those studies have been done, that we've pushed and pushed and we just can't get any further. Um, if, if that was true, I would not have a job, right? That, my job is to figure out how far we can push plasticity through experience creation. I'd say that's like what the main thing I do, whether it's in academics, UCSF, where I'm now, or in companies. Uh, but I haven't seen a lot of aggressive research and development to say, how plastic are we? Like, what, what are we capable of? So I would say that that is pretty bold of a statement to say that these limitations exist and they are not, um, you know, passable. Like, how do we know that? I, I, I have not been convinced by anything I've read, which is, you know, one big source of inspiration for me. Um, so I just want to make that as a first statement. The other is that I, I don't really want to argue about <clears throat> intelligence as a concept because I feel like it's very ambiguous. I've read so many different definitions of it. I don't feel like I work on intelligence as a concept, so I'm not going to step into that. But I would say that intelligence, um, from my perspective, is uh, at least made up of all these different aspects of cognition, which is something I do feel comfortable talking about and do study. So from attention to perception, to decision-making, emotional regulation, all the things we've been talking about, I would say creativity, imagination, that those things come together and probably define <clears throat> intelligence to some 
maybe to a complete degree, I'd love to have that discussion with someone that considers themselves an intelligent ex- intelligence expert, but that's how I view it. And what I see in my work and others is that all of those components are plastic and capable of being improved. Um, so I'm not saying, you know, from the physical fitness analogy that we could turn everyone into an NBA player um, or a professional athlete in any domain. But can anyone get some physical benefit by a personalized, directed training program? I think yes. I mean, I haven't seen exceptions to that. Each person might have different limits. But again, we've pushed really aggressively in the fields of physical fitness. Like there was a time that what four minute mile was impossible to be. We, be, you know, we, we continually show that we're capable of so much more plasticity in our aerobic and strength that anyone ever imagined. Where is the cognitive equivalent of that all out effort of Olympic cognitive athletes? And where have we really pushed to know where those limits are? So Sure, I believe there are limits. Of course, all systems have limitations. But do we know what our limits are? I don't believe we do yet. And I think that we really need to figure that out because if we are just going to assume that we're limited and that's why we don't do the work that needs to be done, we will undoubtedly be limited. Um, we'll be limited by our imagination and our our passion to change. And that's certainly not a limitation that I want to have. So that's my, my high level response. No. And it was a, a terrific response. I think that you're, you're absolutely right that there are so many different definitions of intelligence. The people that I was referring to, I think that their claim to be more specific though we don't have to dwell on it. We can move on was just that they equate or they sort of operationalize intelligence uh, based on the results of psychometric testing, and they have reached the conclusion based on their reading of the research that uh, scores on these tests are stable. I'm not talking about the fin- Flynn effect, so increases over time, but within an individual, they, they remain stable despite uh, interventions. But moving on to these specific components, um, You mentioned attentive capacity and from my discussion with Michael Graziano, who is a, I mean, I'm sure you know him. He's a neuroscientist at Princeton. He said that he thinks attention is the most important component of intelligence. And if we could improve our capacity, our attentive capacity, we would at least better be able to deploy our intelligence, whatever it is. Because if you can't pay attention on the SAT or any task, then you're just not even in the game. So what is the neural basis of intelligence and what's changing as distractibility increases or decreases? Yeah, I agree with his statement 100%. I would say it exactly the same way. And that's, you know, and I sort of said that already in this conversation, you know, attention is that foundational element that all these other aspects rely upon. And attention is like we could spend an hour just talking about attention and the complexities of it, which I I love. It's one of my favorite things to talk about because, you know, as William James, a famous uh, psychologist and scientist has, has, you know, mentioned in in his writings, like attention is such a a commonly used word that we, everyone just inherently feels like they know what it is. And that's probably true to some degree, but it has so much nuance and complexity in it. So you have attention that's driven completely by the environment outside of your goals, bottom up attention. Like if there was an explosion next to you, you would pay attention whether or not you wanted to. And then you have attention that's completely goal directed. You could be focusing on something that's non salient and non life threatening and even suppressing something that is. Uh, which is a very different type of attentional deployment. Um, you have selective attention, you have sustained attention, um, and, and on and on. And there's so many different ways of, uh, of breaking it down. And all of it is critical for our ability to function at a high level and for all animals to function and survive. So I agree that it would be impossible to talk about intelligence without giving due um respect to the role of attention in that, right? How could you even test the elements of intelligence if someone cannot sustain their attention? Like you wouldn't, it wouldn't even be testable really. So 
I, I back that up. Um, and that is why my translational work, um, my intervention work, both in industry and in academics, has almost exclusively focused on attention building approaches because I do think it's foundational to all of this. Mm. Let me ask you just a, a hunch that I have. So this is this is terrible, but I well, lots of people have poor attention spans or think that they do. I'm one of them. I'm somebody who can't focus in class at all. But some of my early podcast episodes, I I mean, I had so much trouble focusing that I would be <laughs> I would like be checking Twitter or something in a, in a conversation. Uh, that's how bad it was. But I spoke with a guest who was interview who has done lots of interviews. And I asked him if he had any advice for me. And he said that it was clear that my eyes were not on him. Uh, most of the, the conversation because I would be distracted. I would be looking around. And since then, since making sure that my eyes are, on the person or the camera the entire time, my intent, my attentiveness has gone way up. And I'm wondering just, this is an aside from, from where our conversation is going, but whether that's something that the research indicates there's some sort of truth behind or something you might be looking at in interventions, just training eye contact on what you're trying to be focused on. Yeah. I, I think that's great advice. It makes so much sense. I haven't read particular research on that, but we have even done some work on where where your eyes are related to things like memory and other. I mean, it's just fascinating. I don't want to go veer us off down other rabbit holes, but one of the ways that that makes sense um, for my research, my work that we've actually done is by it's it's minimizing distraction, right? There's lots of ways of minimizing distraction, right? So if if you have multiple windows open, if you have your notifications coming in. If, if right now you're talking to me and like in your peripheral vision, you see that you have a uh, DM on Twitter that's just sitting there waiting, it's super distracting. Like, how could you not want to look at that? Right. So you could, you could minimize your distraction in multiple ways. One way is, is just hold your eyes front and center. It's a nice quick hack to help minimize. The other thing is you can minimize the distractions in your environment. You could not have two three monitors, multiple windows open at the same time, you could turn off notifications. So I put all that in the category of giving your brain the best chance it has of staying focused by minimizing irrelevant information from your sensorium. And and that's a whole giant discussion on how to do that, why to do that. Um, and it will help, but it will not solve the problem of internal distraction. Um, because you could be looking me right in the eyes and be thinking about the fight you had with your significant other this morning or that project that is coming up tomorrow or even what you're going to have for dinner. And that is just as distracting as those peripheral um, distractions. And so, yes, I think that that is good advice and it should be part of how people stay engaged. But you also need to train and improve your ability to sustain your attention in a focused way uh, beyond those environmental uh, hacks. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. No, that that is confirmation of my hunch. Uh, so that's good. Now, let's talk about just one intervention that you've worked on for attentiveness. And... First of all, okay, so one, what is a closed loop treatment? And then what is closed loop digital med meditation? And, and how does it affect attentive capacity? Great. So this, um, let's bridge now um, from cognition crisis to plasticity, right? So we have, we need better brains. Our brains can become better through plasticity. I don't think anyone denies that. I think that People might question the limits of plasticity, how to harness plasticity, what aspects are more plastic than others, but our brains are plastic, right? We, we know that. It's how you learn throughout your life, right? So we need better brains. Plasticity is a route to that. I feel confident saying that. How do you maximally drive plasticity? How do we do the, the test that I said? Let's push on the system as intensely as we can, just like someone training to become an Olympic athlete would do. And what happens? How much 
do we respond? Where are the limits? What are the individual differences? Things of that nature. And so when you're designing an approach to maximally harness plasticity, which was my goal 15 years ago, thinking about how to do this, like one, <laughs> there's two main routes to do this. Um, one is that you could just take a drug, right? Let's just give that its own space because that's like the main route. That we that people tend to do, right? Uh, my mood's off, my attention's off. I'm gonna take a drug and hopefully just make it get better. And we've been doing that for like 70 years. Whether or not you're debilitated by it and it's prescribed by a doctor, or you just get it from a friend in your university because you want to focus on your test, like this is one of the routes that we that people take to improve cognition. And that that's a whole long discussion about why that has happened and how poorly it has served us. But I'm just going to put that over here, but it's it's worth mentioning. And as a neurologist, that was what I was taught. That's how you help people. You give them drugs. And that's what medicine is. Medicine is dispensing drugs. And that just has not served us well. And so I became really inclined by, really inspired by my early plasticity work to say, are we really, have we really exploited or capitalized on this phenomena of our brain to change itself in response to experience as much as we could? Or have we just said, that doesn't work prematurely and said, we just need a molecule to fix it, which is basically what we did, what we've done for 70 years. Like we all grew up in that system. And so when you challenge yourself as I did and say, okay, let's say plasticity has not been maximally harnessed because we have not had experiences that are powerful, personalized enough to push our brains, what would that look like? So the first thing that I arrived at was that it needs to be adaptive in a personalized way. And so what a closed loop system is, is a system where the input and the output are connected in a feedback loop. And there are many examples of closed loop systems in our lives right now in our engineering, you know, output. So for example, in my office right now, there's a closed loop system. There's a thermostat that is detecting the temperature in this room. And then depending on the set point, either using a cooling or heating system to establish homeostasis and equilibrium. That is a closed loop system. It's, it, you know, it's, it's constantly using data to update and to maintain a certain environmental condition. Uh, modern day washers and dryers use them. You don't say, dry my clothes for 30 minutes, right? And then check, oh, it needs more. That's an open system, right? That's like a horrible way to do it. What you really want to do is put moisture sensors inside the dryer and say, dry my clothes until they're dry. And then you're constantly detecting it. We have very few of these, very few of these closed loop systems in terms of our physiology and from the medical system. So, they're starting systems to detect the onset of seizure and fire um, electrodes um, uh, and stimulators to prevent them. Pacemakers starting to use insulin um, dispensers coupled with glucose monitoring in real time. These are other examples of closed loop systems in medicine. But when it comes to our mind and our brains, we really don't have any. And so the idea behind a closed loop system for plasticity and for attention is to basically do what I, what I just described to you, to use data to guide the output. So for this particular situation, the data would be how much are you focusing? How consistently are you focusing? At what level is that occurring? What type of decisions are you making? How's your memory? Whatever the input is, capturing that data in as close to real time as possible, and then using that data to challenge and reward someone in an appropriate way for the level that they're at. And that closed loop between the data of how you're performing, and that could be physiological or behavioral outputs, and the environment that's being presented back to you, the challenges and the rewards and the stimuli that you're receiving is a closed loop system. And I would say that creates a closed loop cognitive intervention. That's all that I work on. We've designed a dozen of them, um, over a dozen. And that creates a system by which an equilibrium occurs, just like the temperature in this room. That equilibrium is that you are being challenged and rewarded right at the level of your ability. A little bit more, and you're likely to say, this is too hard for me. I'm done. A little bit less, and you're likely to say, 
I'm bored. This is too easy. I'm done. And so if you can maintain that equilibrium, you could challenge someone optimally. And then because our brains are plastic, the bar just raises over time. We don't raise the bar. The bar raises because our brain has that inherent capacity to develop and to adapt. And so as it raises, the system just moves the equilibrium point and keeps the challenge right at the level that is appropriate for you. So that's closed loop designs in terms of cognitive interventions. Hmm. Well, I'm I'm really glad that you mentioned drugs and that they haven't been working because they remind I mean this reminded me of a question that I probably should or it gave me the idea for a question that I probably should have asked you earlier. So just let me ask it now. So as opposed to the conventional medical model, I'm wondering what you think the essential or most important characteristics of the treatments that you develop are. And here are some that just occur to me. I mean, one, they're, they're minimally invasive. They're hopefully optimized to have less or no side effects. They promote autonomy rather than helplessness and dependence. And then perhaps an added benefit is that they promote self-understanding or an actual personal growth and the development of abilities rather than just being something you passively take. Uh, okay. And I'm wondering if there are any others that come to your mind that I might've missed. Oh yeah. Like here's a, here's a big one that you didn't mention, but I am very close to this one because this is the world I'm in now. So all the things you said are true. They're, they're guiding principles, but scalability, accessibility. Great. Yeah. People need to get this, right? This suffering is pervasive throughout the world. Places that we can't get doctors, teachers, pharmaceuticals in, they're walking around with cell phones and Wi-Fi, right? Like we have built a technological infrastructure of both devices and cloud-based servers and Wi-Fi, and it's just going to increase over time that we've largely used for entertainment and communication purposes, but can be used and delivered as tools to help accomplish the goals that we're talking about. So that is another critical part is that this basically uses the same infrastructure that we use for Twitter and video games and Zoom calls, like all of this is already in place. So that is really important to me because Pharmaceuticals just have already proven that they're not deliverable at that scale. Then there's many places in the world that just, you know, Asia is a per perfect example. Like all of Asia doesn't really want their kids on drugs at all. And I get it. Um, or anyone. Uh, there's almost not even a difference between drugs and pharmaceuticals through some lens. And so uh, there is that opportunity that this type of treatment, digitally uh, delivered treatments are going to have the opportunity to scale and reach people so much more effectively, which from a very practical point of view is meaningful to me. And so that's another asset and something that I pay a lot of attention to. Hmm. Yes. Our high powered handheld communication devices that you mentioned earlier, um, this is one reason why we're well disposed now to combat the cognition crisis. And it's kind of this double-edged sword you mentioned to me in an email that the same culprit of the crisis is exactly what can get us out of it. This is why I don't do 10 minute interviews because it is confusing to people that someone that wrote a book called the distracted mind builds video games. And it is, it takes a little bit of time to unpack the fact that technology, any technology, fire, um, nuclear uh, processing, you know, whether it's fusion or, you know, all of these things cut both both ways, right? All of technology, you know, it could cook your food, it could burn your house down, right? And um, drugs could save your life or kill you. I mean, they th none of this has a, a morality, its own directionality. It's all how, how it's used intentionally and how we monitor the consequences. And it's the same thing with technology, whether it be video games or social media, um, it, it can be delivered for such different outcomes. And so, yes, I could write a book talking about the difficulties of our brain's managing to live in this world we've created and all the technology and also develop intentionally and validate and constantly monitor, deliver thoughtfully uh, 
video games as as a type of medicine. And I think those are completely compatible views. They're just all about intentionality and how you use things and how you monitor them. So I'm incredibly excited about technology as a solution to the cognition crisis and as a way of pushing our plasticity beyond the level that any um, anyone that thinks that we have a limit we can't pass, I would challenge them to say we just have not tried hard enough. And I think technology gives us that opportunity. Hmm. Well, I think now is a good time to transition toward some of the interventions you developed with Neuroscape and Achille. And is that how you pronounce it? Okay, Achille. Okay, great. So I, I, I mentioned it earlier, but just right off the bat, what is closed loop digital meditation? And then how does it relate to attentiveness? Yeah. So closed loop digital interventions is what I described, right? So data comes in and guides, you know, the experience that you have. And we've used closed loop design to build over a dozen interventions. We usually deliver them as video games. This is another area that I always have to unpack a little bit because it, it's complicated. I, I think that there's nothing magic about video games. They are a digitally delivered experience that's usually intended to create engagement and fun. Um, we try to accomplish that as well because if people are going to take our medicine, whether they're healthy or not healthy, um, the fact that they engage deeply at in it in the moment drives plasticity and the fact that they engage in it multiple times is also important for outcomes. Like nothing changes very easily. And so we build these as video games and we have many, many different kinds of them. Some take place in virtual reality, uh, head mounted displays, others use tablets. Some involve like lots of like the one that we developed with Achille, um, involves lots of like high speed, decisions and switching and distraction and multitasking. And then some of them are meditation-based and, and that's sort of what you alluded to. And so our meditation-based interventions, we have two of them. One's called Metatrain, one's called Engage. They're both game-like. Engage is very much a game. Medi Metatrain is much less a game. Uh, Metatrain, you play with your eyes closed. It's built on the principles of concentrated focus meditation, breath-focused meditation. And it just uses closed loop design, unlike real world meditation. It doesn't also require the presence of a human expert, which I think also contributes to its scalability potential. And um, so in our MetaTrain game, which we now have three papers and we're about to uh, publish our fourth, pub uh, a fourth study, you... Uh, Start meditating. You're first told by our, our collaborator, Jack Cornfield, who's a, a, a master in, in meditation and mindfulness and for his whole life. And he's been an amazing collaborator in this work. And you're given instructions on what it means to focus on your breath and lots of different tools uh, and, and approaches in which to accomplish that. You're told just like traditional meditation, if you went to a Vipassana retreat to focus on your breath, um, hold your attention there. If your attention pulls away, that's okay. No need to judge it negatively. Just be aware of it and bring your attention back to your breath. That's the instructions. However, in MetaTrain, you start with doing that just for 10 seconds. And then you introspect whether or not you were successful or did your mind wander? Were you distracted? So that's the data that goes into the system. It's introspective data. We're also working on using physiological data to determine that whether or not you're aware of it. That data goes into the system and then based on that data, the closed loop is that you have more or less time. If you were successful, you get more time. If you were unsuccessful in holding your attention to your breath, you have less time. And the algorithms constantly adjust over the course of multiple days. It gives you feedback. You get graphs on how you're doing. You have good days. You have bad days. Most people, we've now tested hundreds of people in six-week training sessions with different versions of this. And most people that do not have a meditation practice are just capable of doing 10 to 15 seconds without interruption, without even noticing that they get interrupted on day one. Most people, after six weeks, get over a minute, some people over two minutes. And that's really interesting and something we're excited about. Many of these people did not feel that they were successfully able to um, initiate real life meditation programs um, that they would sit in a room and be like, I don't know what I'm doing here. They were just given too long of a time and they didn't build the um, capabilities in a gentle way um, as we do with MetaTrain. And what, but 
we're most excited about is that our outcomes transfer beyond the meditation time uh, that we record sort of in game play. So we see improvements in sustained attention. We see physiological changes. This is what we write about in our papers. We have a paper that we're writing now in older adults that we see improved stress responsivity, improvements in attention, and also lengthening of telomeres, a cellular marker. Of, yeah, we're very excited. Reverse about this. aging, maybe. Reverse. This is in six weeks of using Metatrain on, on a tablet at home, older adults. This is unpublished data, uh, but we are very, very excited about it. And really, um, most, um, I'd say most passionate about the opportunity to create these really profound transfer effects. People always con, you know, you know, in, in our field, and, and I think you're familiar with this transfer, like, okay, you get better at that, but how much do you get better at things out of it? And we've shown transfer in a dozen papers and some people are like, okay, that's transfer, but that's not much transfer. So you could just argue this forever. But I would say that playing a, a meditation game with your eyes closed and showing one that you have increased processing speed on a, performance visual task is pretty remarkable transfer of attention from very, very different contexts. And then I would say that showing that that also increases your telomere length is remarkable transfer. So uh, these are examples of plasticity, not just of our minds, but our of our bodies and other systems showing that with closed loop designs that constantly pressure the system in an adaptive way, you're capable of really amazing change. And so that's what we've been doing with closed loop meditation. I won't spend forever on this because we could, but we have a, another game called Engage, which is targeted more towards younger children that really have trouble finding their breath. It's just really abstract to, you know, once you drop, keep dropping down in age, go to, you know, fifth graders, fourth graders, third graders, at some point you're like, what do you mean focus on my breath? So we're like, all right. Why don't we have you focus on collecting insects in an alien world with your eyes closed? And first, we'll teach you what they are in a visual version of the game. And then you close your eyes and you have to find them and don't find the bad ones, find the good ones. And, you know, we could get, you know, six-year-olds to essentially meditate with headphones on, eyes closed in a way that we could never have them focus on their breath. So that's a little taste of Engage, but that's another closed loop game. Well, the last thing I'll ask about the Closed loop meditation, though, is you mentioned three or four papers that, or a fourth that's coming out on physio. I think you said it was on physiological changes, and both physiological and performance changes. Okay, what cognitive. is happening in the brain of somebody who's playing Metatrain for six weeks? Yeah, so this is an interest. We're, we're getting ready to write a paper on our dozens of papers that we've had across all of our games that some you know, have very different types of interactivity, but converge on common neural systems that change. It, it goes back to our earlier conversation about the prefrontal cortex and its networks with the rest of the brain. That's what we tend to see change is that the prefrontal cortex, um, and we could see this with EEG and with functional imaging, it's so different types of signals converging on the, the common story that the network's and communication that the prefrontal cortex has with other brain areas can be strengthened and, and made more consistent. That's really a very common, most recent finding is that it's not just the magnitude of, you know, however you measure power or magnitude of those functional connections, but the consistency that you're engaging them over repeated trials um, increases. So in other words, there's a decrease in variability, like response time variability is the performance metric. And you might find like interregional theta coherence is a physiological marker of that, that really maps onto that, which is a very similar measure, one physiological and the other um, a psychometric outcome. But they're basically telling the same story is that these systems are now being engaged more consistently over time, which is the hallmark of what it means to have attention span or sustained attention. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure if if this is related to attentiveness. Uh, just quick yes or yes, no. Is Endeavor related to attentiveness? Okay, great. Then a new game that, that you've released through Achille, Achille 
interactive is Endeavor OTC. And as I was I was looking at Endeavor OTC, I was like, hmm, OTC, I wonder what OTC means. And then I scroll down and I see Endeavor RX. And so there are two versions of this game. One is prescribable and one is over the counter. So maybe first, what is Endeavor? What is the game? Why is there an over the counter and a prescription version? This is such a juicy conversation. This is this is the most relevant to today, this conversation. I mean, the rest has been building the framework for it. Let me let me just start by distractibility. You, exactly. <laughs> let me uh yeah, turn off my ringer. It's amazing that it hasn't bothered me before this. Um, let's just talk a little bit about Endeavor. So this is a long story that I'm going to tell very quickly. You Endeavor, can tell, tell it long <laughs> if you want to. I'll, I will tell it as quick as I can, but it won't be as short as 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 it as I would like it to be. But Endeavor, the game, which is Achilles' product that's out in the real world, uh, began as a game called NeuroRacer um, in my lab. 15 years ago, 2008 um, is when I started working on it. NeuroRacer was my first closed loop video game that I ever built. I did it with friends that worked at LucasArts. And we, I had, this was my very first idea of a closed loop intervention to improve attention abilities. And my target population were healthy older adults because that's where most of my research was. That's where I have so many publications showing that older adults have declining attention abilities and it impairs their lives. So that was my target. Um, I did actually some drug trials uh, using Aricept, the drug that we used to treat Alzheimer's disease with modest effects. I mean, it yielded a publication, but it certainly wasn't anything that I would run out and tell people to use for their attention abilities as they got older. So this is the, this is sort of the very real story that is a nice accompaniment to the more abstract story that I already shared with you, um, which was more my inspiration. This is what I tried to do. Let's build a closed loop video game to improve attention abilities in older adults. That was my goal. That was basically the introduction to numerous grants that I wrote and got rejected to accomplish this. Finding, finally getting funding in 2009 by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation after the NIH rejected it multiple times. And what we built was a game called NeuroRacer. And this game was a closed loop game. It was a driving game that um, challenged older adults to focus on a selective discrimination task of identifying a certain sign and ignoring other signs at the same time navigating a car along a road like a sort of sensory motor tracking task and you had to do them at the same time and you only leveled up in the game you only got the rewards that you were advancing if they both got better um, that was like a very important ingredient of this that we did not have at the beginning and the hypothesis was that because networks, prefrontal cortical networks in your brain that are engaged when you multitask and when you resist distraction overlap and are related to networks that you engage when you're sustaining attention in a single task, even with, even with your eyes closed, like the very opposite in, in what feels like an opposite type of attention deployment, that there are similar networks involved. My hypothesis was that if we could push you in this domain, to hold your attention, to switch your attention, to resist distraction, all in a closed loop at the highest level we can do that I could imagine working with like designers from LucasArts, like what could we do to push this as if we're training for an Olympic attention, you know, event? What would happen to attention abilities that were very different than gameplay? sustaining your attention in a really boring task, one thing at a time, no rewards, no colors, no lights, none of that. And my hypothesis was that it would transfer, that if you could build this under this condition, you would see the benefits under this condition. And that is what we found. That paper was published in Nature. It was the cover of Nature in uh, 2003. This is actually uh, two, 2013. So this is the 10-year anniversary of that. It was sub September of, of 2003, September 5th very important day in my life, cover of nature's, maybe that comes along once in a scientist's life. And that's what we found. We found that this game, this is five years after starting it. So um, there's a whole bunch of public uh, findings in there that I won't spend too much time on now. But basically, we recorded neural activity before and after to show the mechanism. We showed the benefits. We showed some sustained benefits um, six months later. Um, and what this was, was not a 
license to now prescribe this. I had never told any other older adult to play Neuroracer. It wasn't even available on any existing operating system anymore. It was really a prototype and a signal that there was something here that we could build a unique type of video game, a closed loop video game. We could do a very careful, there were three groups in this, two control groups. We could do a very careful research study with neural outcomes, show a transfer of benefits, show neural neurological mechanism of action and say, there's something here. We did that. One of the biggest criticisms, which is a funny scientific criticism, was that this hasn't been replicated, which of course is true. It was the first paper. It's now been replicated over a dozen times in different populations with different versions of the game. So I'm very happy a decade later of what we have done, given you know, especially given the replication crisis that science faces. And so Neuroracer became Endeavor. So now I'm going to jump 15 years ahead, a company was started, Achille. I am a co-founder of Achille. So disclosure here, I'm a founder. I have equity, founder equity. I started this company. I never had an executive position in Achille. I've been a board member. I'm a science advisor. I am the inventor of the original technology, but I have a 100% position at UCSF as a professor. But that was basically a transfer from UCSF. Matter of fact, UCSF owns the patent behind their eraser, which is the methodology of the closed loop game. Achille built out a way better game, but we preserve the underlying engine of the game that's described in the patent that is the exact same as Neuroracer. That is what Endeavor is. Endeavor's had over 30 clinical trials in many populations, all showing improvements in sustained attention outside of the game from major depressive disorder to children with ADHD, to lupus, to multiple sclerosis, on and on, all converging on the same finding, Ir- agnostic to the population that's engaging in it, right? It has nothing to do with the underlying pathological conditions of them. It's just that it strengthens attention abilities. This game then went through, um, for the first time ever, a de novo medical device approval process at the FDA, and it was imp- approved after two years, looking at both efficacy and side effects, which are very low, as you might imagine. And the game was approved in 2020 as a class two medical device therapeutic option to treat children, eight to 12 year olds with ADHD. And so with that, Endeavor RX was born, the first ever video game approved by the FDA for any medical condition, the first ever digital treatment for children of any sort approved by the FDA. And we began moving this into the world as a prescription only treatment for ADHD in children through their doctors. And that is Endeavor RX. So I'll pause there just to make sure I haven't monologued too long. And I can tell you about Endeavor OTC, which is like fascinating, but that's sort of the 15 year journey from an idea all the way through a treatment that's out in the world that is an alternative to things like Adderall or maybe not an alternative can be used in conjunction. Okay. That's awesome. I have tons of questions, but I think that I should let you finish and talk about Endeavor OTC first, and then I'll I'll jump back in. Um, Yeah. The short story is that It worked. Um, Endeavor RX is working. People prescribe it in every state in this country. There are, you know, over 10,000, probably over 15,000 prescriptions written by doctors for kids. Um, We have tons of data that we're generating, tons of anecdotes, you know, parents crying about seeing, you know, the outcomes. Does it work for everyone? No, of course not. But it's working. Every month we have more prescriptions, um, which is impressive. It's a, it's a, completely new medical category. It had a de novo pathway. I'm very proud of it, but I could tell you it is not working fast enough from a business perspective. And the main reason why, there are two reasons why. One, the physician gatekeeper is really challenging, right? Because if a clinical psychologist in a elementary school sees a kid that has an ADHD diagnosis, they have to refer them to to a physician to get a prescription. So, and, you know, some physicians have been doing, you know, Adderall treatment for, you know, or Ritalin treatment for 40 years. They're not like, what a video game is a treatment. So there is a hurdle to overcome that limits the scaling that needs to occur for any company to be successful. And it's not, it's largely not reimbursable by insurance, um, which is really sort of the valley of death for many companies, if you're not very big companies. So there is, 
very frequently the data exists for any medical device. It's not specific for digital therapeutics between when you get regulatory approval and when you get insurance reimbursement. It could be on average six years. And during that time, there's a whole host of people that don't have the money to pay for prescription medicine. Prescription medicines have to be much more expensive than other things, largely because the prescription process itself is so expensive. There are so many middlemen along the way. This was all education to me. And so there's only so low you can have for prescription medicine before your company is just basically giving it away. And what we started doing was essentially like giving away half of our treatment for people in need that didn't have money. And you just can't run a business like that. You know, you can't, you can't successfully ever become profitable. And in these times, you can't raise money anymore. And so we were, we were pretty confident that if we continued with Endeavor RX as a prescription only model, we would go bankrupt. There is one other company that had a prescription digital therapeutic before Achilles. It was not a video game. It was a cognitive behavioral therapy. That company is called Pair Therapeutics. And they went bankrupt as a prescription digital therapeutic, unable to accomplish this because of lack of reimbursement. And we did not want that to happen to us. And so we pivoted. We just now publicly announced this, which allows me to talk about this. I didn't mention, but Achilles is now a public company. Um, we, we went through an IPO um, a little over a year ago. And so we have announced a pivot away from prescription digital therapeutics as Achilles focus to over the counter. So everyone probably has heard of over the counter. That's why we use Endeavor OTC. It distinguishes those products. Endeavor OTC is available for adults on the app store and now through Android without a prescription. You don't have to tell your doctor about it. You can download it. It's still in an FDA pathway right now. Um, there is was an emergency um, digital treatment pathway initiated during COVID that we've managed to use to keep the OTC there. We are now applying through the FDA for OTC designation. They're actually not the same. You need both RX and OTC as separate as, as, as separate approvals. But we're excited about having a digital treatment that has all the rigor and validation that we saw in our RX product, but taking the doctor and the insurance companies out of the loop. Because now we could charge a lot less that we don't have prescription processing in there. And now we also go directly to our customers, which are patients in need of all ages without having to go through a doctor. So that's what Endeavor OTC is. Okay, great. Now I have a lot of questions. I actually want to go back to NeuroRacer, just start from the beginning. But before we go to NeuroRacer, are the OTC and RX versions of Endeavor the same video game? Or did you have to make changes uh, for an OTC product, just because I know like if you get prescription strength Tylenol, it's going to be stronger. It's going to be a different product. Yeah. So they are the same. They are the same engine. There are differences with the prescription version, largely related to how it interfaces with the patient and their doctor and their parent and what other medics. So it, it, it's more of a full treatment program as you would expect for an RX. Um, so like what, you know, it's asking what drugs are you taking? Are you on Adderall? Um, you know, and it connects all of the caregivers and stakeholders in that process. Endeavor OTC is free from that. It is just the active ingredient delivered to you. Um, there are many examples of prescription and OTC products that are exactly the same. Uh, um, you know, I have a friend that recently was looking for a birth control uh, pill um, and they were like, well, you can get the OTC or the prescription. Same thing. Prescription comes with your doctor's awareness. It may get insurance reimbursement. You get type of instructions, but the treatment's the same. And so that exists. And so we would fall more into that category. And so this is a new area for us. I don't think there is another example of a digital therapeutic that is OTC. So we're like an uncharted territory figuring out how to get our treatment that we are confident works to people in need in a way that's accessible to them and in a way that makes our company sustainable <laughs> so that we could keep doing this and create new treatments. Mm. So, okay, starting starting back with NeuroRacer, when I was reading about it, I saw that it was geared toward improving cognitive control. Is that different from attentiveness? No. Well, yeah. So cognitive control is sort of a bit of an umbrella term. Like 
people use executive function, cognitive control, how I define it, is essentially different aspects of attention. So uh, selective attention, working memory, task switching, all of that would fit into the cognitive control umbrella. And we actually found in our nature paper benefits in, in sustained attention, but also working memory. These are very related concepts. So that's why there is an umbrella term that brings them together so nicely. There are common neural networks involved, which is why we see benefits across domains. Um, and that they are, uh, you know, transfer is not a magic trick. Like there has to be some mechanistic bridge between them in order to, for it to happen. And so that paper and even the title of that paper was directed at cognitive control because we looked at multiple different outcomes of cognitive control and sort of benefits beyond classic sustained attention, which is we did find, but also in terms of working memory, which is holding information in mind for short periods of time, which is another type of attention. Mm -hmm. How does working memory, I was going to ask about working memory, how does it fit into a racing game? It, it, it doesn't, which is why it's such awesome transfer. There is very, There are very little working memory demands in Neuroracer or in Endeavor for that matter, which is why the transfer to better working memory for faces in older adults was such a cool outcome. Uh, you have to remember like that it's a green circle you're responding to. I don't think anyone forgets that. That's a pretty low working memory demand. So like when a green pentagon pops up, you have trouble suppressing it because it looks similar, but not because you think green pentagon is your target. So the fact that you could play a game that has almost no working memory demand and then get better working memory is like another really important example of transfer. And we, you know, so that that's why when people in the field are like, there's no such thing as transfer. These are not plastic. You know, I'm like, well, how do you explain that? Right? Like that to me is, a, and we've replicated those type of findings. So that's not trained specifically by the game. That is an outcome of the benefits of you get by having a better attentional deployment system. You get to deploy it in different ways. Hmm. And you, you just mentioned again, replicated across population. So it was, it's agnostic condi to conditions. Uh, you mentioned ADHD. It's also agnostic to age. Seems to be true. Okay, that's so cool. And just before I go on, I mean, this must feel so great given that your goal was always to make meaningful intervention. So congratulations. It's not every day. There's a, a new class of medicine. Thank you. It's uh, it, it's great. Uh, you know, I, I, forget, I forget the joy sometimes because... I'm so focused on actually successfully delivering it now that, you know, I just get caught up in the fact that insurance doesn't reimburse for it, but kids are in need and we know that there's no side effects and the FDA approved it. It's like, why would you not reimburse for it? It's like, it's mind boggling to me and depressing. Um, and so we need to have a new business plan. We need to, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to figure out how to make this work, even though it seems to be effective and people need it. And so I forget sometimes to celebrate the fact that as a scientist, I've been able to do something like this, which is so hard to do. But, um, you know, I am super happy and I, and it's not just me. I mean, I work with hundreds of people on this to get here and we're super proud that we have something that traveled from an idea all the way into a kid's hands that, give them so much satisfaction. And you know, one of the amazing joys that I have is as a scientist, you just, you know, we look at P values and effect sizes. And if they're all in alignment, we get a publication. We're like, yeah, that's great. I mean, if you're really, really fortunate, it's in a journal like Nature. And that's incredibly gratifying. But I can say that hearing firsthand a 14-year-old and their mom tell me about how this has affected their life when everything else has failed. It's just tear inducing, right? That is another level of reward. It's not a p-value. It's a n of one story, but it's really been incredibly meaningful to me to be able to have that as part of my life is that there are people that are actually being helped that can talk about it really eloquently. Hmm. Well, I know you've worked on a lot of other sorts of interventions beyond video games. There are just two other things that I want to make sure that I asked about. So this is 
an area that's very close to my heart and I guess also indirectly related to intelligence, which I'm just interested in. But have you worked on games or other interventions that are oriented around improving sleep or that otherwise just have a transfer effect to improved sleep? Such a timely question. So we have not targeted sleep improvement as an outcome up until recently. But based upon anecdotal reports from our participants in our Metatran study, that they sleep better, we're like, we should study that. And so uh, folk faculty at Neuroscape, so Neuroscape's a center here at UCSF, is not an Achilles thing, only Endeavor's Achilles. All the other games we've been talking about are still in the academic world, they're in Neuroscape. One of our faculty members, David Ziegler, um, and, and in, in collaboration with others, has received an NIH R61 grant to look at Metatrain and its impact on sleep with home physiological recordings and, uh, you know, actigraphy and all these really cool um, approaches to see if it improves sleep. So we're actually studying it right now. That study was just funded and is launching imminently. Okay. Well, that's very awesome. Very yeah, cool. I'm super excited about it too. Do you, are you familiar with the name Robert Stickgold? It sounds familiar. Yeah. He's a, a sleep researcher at Harvard. I, it, I don't recall if he's a neuroscientist, uh, but I think, I think he is a neuroscientist, but he's in the medical school at the department of psychiatry. But we talked all about sleep and one of the, the hunches I had that I, that he confirmed and he actually does this. I had, I had a hunch that, or, you know what hypnagogic dreams are? So I don't, I don't know how common that, that, uh, uh, phrase is, but I realized that before I, so for our listeners who don't know what hypnagogic dreams are, they're sleep onset dreams where your thinking just kind of goes really haywire and things aren't, thoughts aren't appearing in your head coherently. And I just, I noticed when I was in bed that as soon as I started having these thoughts, I was dimly aware, oh, I'm about to fall asleep. And I started, I asked him if he thought that sort of starting to think like that on purpose will improve or expedite sleep onset. And he said, yes, and he does that. And I tried it and my sleep onset has gotten so much better. I just started thinking, oh, the marshmallows walking to the store and it, just thinking about strange things. And I just fall asleep. I love it. I mean, I know about the phenomena, you know, and it also could be a kind of like sleep paralysis, which can occur at that hypnagogic phase of transition. Um, but I've never heard it as like a sleep st onset strategy. It's yeah, really I hadn't either. Maybe it's a, a fodder for a future game. I'll yeah, let you, let yeah. you take that. I like it. I like idea. it. <laughs> but before we switch from video games, do you have any broad uh, prophecies or anything about what the next 5, 10, 20 years of the future of video game research for therapeutics is going to be like? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's what I, I like to do the most. And it's what I sort of feel like I'm best at is imagining the future and okay, cool towards that future. There was a time that what we just talked about in the present was my future vision 15 years ago of a game approved through the FDA. And so where's my next 10 or 15 years is, you know, that's, that's what I spend most of, you know, that's my fun time is thinking about that and then trying to implement it. And we have a lot of those research studies begun that hopefully it'll be like the NeuroRacer study uh, from a decade ago and will set us on, on the path of what the next level of all this is. So I will, try to do this um, in a concise way. What, what, what we've been talking about are closed loop interventions that gather data about you in the moment that then feed back an environment consisting of rewards, challenges, and stimuli that move your brain to some other place. And it could be all sorts of different mechanics to accomplish that. 
So the mechanics might be ones of meditation or rhythm and music. We have games that involve physical fitness integrated with cognitive challenges. We have navigation games and virtual reality and, you know, head mounted displays. And so, but, but the underlying core principle of design is the same. So let's start with that premise that data about you flows into a processor that then updates your environment in such a way that over time changes your brain because of plasticity, right? That's the underlying framework of everything that we've ever built, including what Achilles game is. Where do we go from that? Well, you could move on both sides of the closed loop. So you could feed in much richer or real-time comprehensive data about you than just what Achille does, which is your performance outcome, right? Like how fast you're responding. It's using the accelerometer. It's using the tap screen, like great sensors to pick up your performance. But, you know, a lot of processing occurs before those outcomes that are valuable data that we're not accessing. So we have a program at, Neuro, at Neuroscape called MMBS, Multimodal Biosensing, where we hook up almost... a oh, I think we're approaching 180 electrodes, capturing data from body and brain with an emphasis on signal processing and machine learning to try to make interpretable, real-time, actionable signals about your state, your arousal, your valence, your attention, your awareness, to really be able to decode these states so that that is the input arm to the closed loop, right? So that's the that's the you know science fiction sounding future of what the input arm to the closed loop looks like. The output arm of the closed loop is not just looking down at a at your mobile phone, but being in a full sensory immersive environment where the environment is real and more engaging and more updated, and that is what we've built. Also, we have a full sensory immersion lab at Neuroscape now. And so the future is that the closed loop will be much, much richer data about you in the moment, feeding a processor that then will put you in an environment that's much more immersive in real world. And the hypothesis is that we will have much greater effects of changing all these aspects of your cognition, further pushing the limitations of plasticity. So this is what I mean when I say, have we really tried all the things? Like, has anyone tried what I just described? No. Absolutely. No one has. And so that's what we're building. And that's what I think the 10-year vision is of, of this technology. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I should, one, that sounds so cool. I love to hear it. And then again, maybe I should add a caveat to what I said earlier. Um, what these re researchers seem to believe was that no interventions up to this point uh, had demonstrated that intelligence or personality could really shift, but I don't think they were saying it was impossible. It just hasn't been done yet. And they're hoping that it could be. There are people that seem to say it's impossible. So that's maybe why I have some, some of that in, in my rhetoric is that I hear that sometimes and I'm like, how do you know that? And, you know, but but yes, and also we're not just talking about general intelligence here. We're talking about very specific aspects of cognition that I have become convinced are malleable. Mm. And maybe just to summarize, to make sure that I understood the 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 two ways uh, of that you're hoping things will change or expecting things to change are we're going to have improved sensors that are going to collect more data for input, and then on the other end is really improving the immersive experience. But then the third thing that didn't get mentioned is we have to develop the software to take advantage of these things. Exactly. And one big part of that third thing is AI. Oh, cool. Tell me more. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have, imagine you have the situation that I just described where you have 180 electrodes of data with the most advanced sensors and signal processing that exists, right? We've got like video working on it, you know, which is, uh, you know, has been a collaborator in the past. And we were really able to, to still work to collect r data that's so rich in real time. And let's say we have the ability to present 
an environment that is completely immersive, that's like holodeck, right? It feels real, right? So both of those things haven't happened, but let's say they do happen. How are we going to manage the communication between this input arm and this output arm? And that's where software, lots of software advances, but not the least of which is machine learning, will help on both sides of it. So machine learning can help us interpret this data. I call I sort of call that interpretive AI. <laughs> I don't know if that term exists, but I use that term. So the goal is not, it's not generative AI. It's not creating anything. It's just trying to say, is, is this person aroused or sedated? Is this person happy or sad or plus valence, negative valence? Is their attention internal or external? We need interpretive AI and machine learning tools to understand because this data is so immense and so dynamic and so rich that it's just beyond any analytical approach that we really have right now. So that's that's the use of AI. Just I'm slipping back between ML and AI because they become so interchangeable. But that, that's what I'm. That's what I mean by AI here is that we need to we need to advance our analytical and al algorithmic capacities to interpret the data. Then, how do we present these immersive worlds? Do we have like just hundreds of artists and musicians working on narratives, and they're constantly updating the environment, and like they're just pulling from asset pools all the time, which is sort of what we do now. Or do we use the future of generative AI to create immersive environments driven by interpretive AI data sets? So that is the third component of it is, is like two bi-directional AI acting to couple the closed loop input and output arm. Yeah, so cool. And I'm going to raise the ante even further and add a fourth component that is going to be uh, another segue. And so talked about increasing sensors, um, improving uh, immersion. Uh, so one, we're, we're taking out of the body, we're trying to give back to the body in one way, and then there's AI bridging it. But one thing that you haven't talked about is direct interventions on the brain itself. And there are two ways in which I see you working on this and continuing to work on this in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. One is with non-invasive brain stimulation, and then the other is with psychedelics. And maybe we should t take those in turn. Sure. We're, we're, we're reigning all, all the elements of my, my life and my research, at, uh, which is great because I don't normally get to go this far um, in discussion, but it's all... It's not all theoretical. All of this research is happening right now at UCSF and Neuroscape. And so what I described to you is all true. So let's just package that up, put that over here. It's going to take us a decade to fully realize that. I'm also interested in how we can use blunter instruments, less precise. In the most precise instrument, let me, let me first say that the most precise instrument that we have to improve brain function, I would say, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this, is experience that we do, we are not capable of activating neural networks in any more selective way than we can do through experience alone. There's no amount of brain stimulation, even invasive brain stimulation, no drug can do it that we've ever seen that activates networks selectively, like having an experience does. That's like how our brain works. It's using its own like sort of operating system. And so that's why everything we do is experiential. Everything we do is driven through an interactive, it could be passive, um, experience that's creative. So that's the foundation to everything we do. That's why I sort of frame this as experiential medicine. But I believe that there are blunter instruments that do not have the selectivity of an experience that can heighten the effects. And two of those are non-invasive brain stimulation and, and molecules, specifically psychedelics. So let's talk about non-invasive brain stimulation. So we have... I, th I don't know if quite a dozen, but close to a dozen now papers, and there are hundreds of others in the literature that show that magnetic and electrical stimulation um, and all types of electrical stimulation from random noise to direct currents to alternating currents, most of our work is with alternating currents applied to the brain, to different brain regions, can heighten plasticity. But it's blunt. It's not specific. It's you know sort of affecting like the entire front part of your brain. But what we have shown is that when coupled with an experience, especially a closed loop experience, we can accelerate learning 
at least within the domain of that intervention. Whether or not that accelerates transfer effects and leads to longer benefits, that's a question that we're exploring. So that's one way, is that you can do everything that I described before with and we already have electrodes on you, we could stimulate your brain, let's say with a theta rhythm, like a low, you know, four hertz, four hertz rhythm, um, alternating across your frontal lobes and accelerate the outcomes of that experience. That is one area that we're pursuing, but it's a blunt instrument. Like I said, we would never do a study of just brain stimulation alone necessarily, at least not in our hands. We'd always couple it with an experience to get the selective network activation during the stimulation. Same thing for psychedelics. I think there's an incredible clinical world that is opened up again, showing all the benefits of both classic psychedelics and things like MDMA and, and ketamine on many different clinical populations. And I'm very excited about it. We were actually um, a, a site in the most recent uh, MAPS trial for MDMA used for PTSD treatment. Jenny Mitchell, who's, who's in our group, was the first author in that Nature Medicine paper just came out. I'm very excited in general what, about psychedelics in the clinical domain, but why it's a neuroscape is because it is another, I would say, blunt instrument. Um, and the reason you know it's blunt is that no one just says, hey, take some psychedelics, see how that works out for you and call me in a month. Why? Because it's blunt, because you put it in there and into your brain and the outcomes are highly driven by the experience, by what's going on around you. Are you in a safe place or a threatening place? Are you in nature or not nature? Do you have um, a facilitator guiding you? Are you listening to music? And that's all evidence that the molecule itself is rather blunt in its actions and needs the guidance of the experience, what's known in the field as set and setting. So how can we now take everything that we've talked about and add psychedelics, maybe in a much lower dose, because we don't need the full perceptual, you know, events to lead to the effects we want. But what would that do to help increase plasticity of the system? So both psychedelics and non-invasive brain stimulation have in common and of interest to us in that they are plasticity inducing. At least that's what I would say the data suggests. And that's why we would couple it with our other system to lead to bigger effects. Mm. One question I have about these two modalities is whether your research suggests why uh, non-invasive brain stimulation or psychedelics have these effects on plasticity. Yeah, we haven't done a lot of the fu fundamental work in it, but from the non-invasive brain stimulation, so people would suggest that on the on the DC side, on the direct current side, it's raising resting membrane depolarization and causing neurons to fire more readily. It's not causing them to fire like TMS does, transcranial magnetic stimulation, but they're more likely to fire, right? Their, their, their threshold is now reduced for them to create these responses. And so if you engage in something that is a learning experience that's challenging the brain, the plasticity is induced because the system is sort of at a more dynamic state. Similar explanation has been used on the psychedelic side. And a lot of this is obviously still not known, but you know, there's this is work in animal models showing increased spine and you know density in mice under psilocybin exposure. So there are elements of the molecular treatment that also seem to guide the very molecular plasticity mechanisms that lead to um, all sorts of different plasticity markers. A lot of this data is, has been better defined in animals than in humans, but um, that is at least mechanistically where those two fields are. Okay. Well, this has been so awesome. And toward finishing up, this isn't always possible. Uh, if I'm talking to, I don't know, um, a biologist who researches ancient life, I can't always do this, but it's nice when possible to find practical takeaways for people. And as somebody who spends all of his research time uh, and a lot of his non-research time on thinking about how to improve cognitive function. Do you have any advice or things that you do on a daily basis that are easily actionable to improve cognitive function that people might sure. be able to do? 100%. So 
what I described to you is my own, I, I like to think of Neuroscape as like an applied science fiction center, right? Like that is using the latest technologies to create precision instruments to drive plasticity and improve cognition. And I'm going to keep working until we get there, but they're not available. I mean, some of them are starting to be available, endeavors available, available, and you know, uh, people and friends that feel like I could use better attention are using it. People with ADHD, so I'm very happy about that. But it is one tool, small tool in in what we need is much larger uh, tool chest um, in order to to have the impact that we need to have. So, what do we do in the meanwhile? Right, that was a long way of saying like we're not there yet, and. Um, what what, are we, what can we do without all these fancy technologies that I've been talking about? And it's sort of the same thing, right? The idea is that experience, targeted experiences drive outcomes and harnesses our brain's plasticity and our body's plasticity. And we've come up with closed loop approaches that do it in a really powerful way. You can do it for less time. But you want to, you know, what I do, I, I, I'm not like a self-help person. I, I think I could come closer than other people, other scientists, but mostly I like to give myself help in terms of talking about just what I do, because I feel more comfortable in that domain than say, you should do what I do. This is just what I do. So I feel that I give a lot of attention to the experiences in my life. What are, what am I taking in? Um, not just in terms of food but in terms of information. How am I consuming my information? How am I consuming my food? And how do I engage in my interactions with other people and with nature? So that's sort of like the foundational part of how I try to judge what I'm doing in my life. Um, in terms of specifics, physical fitness, tons of data in terms of keeping our brains healthy, kids, adults, seniors, both aerobic training, phys uh, strength training. So I pretty much exercise every single day. Um, it's on my calendar or else it'll be missed. So that's a very important part of my life. Sleep is very important to me. You brought up sleep. I have babies now, so sleep is hard, but I still do my, do my absolute best. Um, eating, nutrition, I follow, I think as close to like what would be described as a Mediterranean diet um, as I can. Uh, stress, I wouldn't say stress, annihilation. I think some stress is good. I think stressing the system is critical. Uh, data would suggest we respond to stress. There's a difference between challenge and hopeless, helpless, chronic stress. So keeping you know, a, a challenging life is important to me. I challenge myself all the time in tons of ways and it's work, but I feel I am better for it. Um, spending time in nature, just out in the redwoods all weekend with my family. Um, no, you know, no devices really. Just really spending time and with beautiful trees and mountains and streams, um, and you know, really engaging with people in a in a thoughtful, intentional way. Not being distracted, clearing my environment of distractions as much as possible. Minimizing multitasking. Certainly, if I need to do something important, that's the sort of list. Okay, so just to dig in and clarify on just one point, you sort of elaborated on this as you went along, but when you say you focus on experiences like eating, interacting with people, nature, et cetera, does this mean that you try to make sure literally that you are eliminating distractions and avoiding multitasking when doing all of these things in as much as is possible? So like when you're eating, you just try not to be looking at your phone, things like that. Yes. So I would give a caveat to that. There are times when I believe I'm doing something that's so unimportant and so easy to do that if I'm not multitasking, I would go insane trying to do it. Like it's just too boring. Like, you know, cleaning up my my closet, you know, doing something that Yeah. So it, uh, there are there are times where multitasking is a great thing to do. Listen to music, check your phone, take a break, whatever. You, you have something to get done. It's not life-threatening. It's not as important as having a conversation with someone or finishing an article that has a time pressure. So yeah, multitasking is fun. It's lots of novelty. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's switching is great. So I don't eliminate those things all the time. I just choose when I do it. If I go into my daughter's room and want to engage with her while she gets ready in the morning, I don't bring my phone with me. That would just be stupid 
because I would look at it. I would, I would know it was there. It would, I would be tempted. And so, yes, it, 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 when I'm doing something that I intentionally want to be focused on, having dinner with my family, um, engaging with a friend, finishing an article that's due in, in a couple of hours or the next day, I minimize distraction and multitasking. But I do use those things in, in, in other settings. Okay. This is, this is such good advice because it's something that I'm trying to uh, hone in on in my own life because I have these compulsions to be doing things all the time. So this is great. Um, talking to you about your research is amazing. It's, it's so cool. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me, Adam. And I hope uh, sometime down the road, we can talk on what you've been doing in, in the, the months and years after this conversation. Wonderful. I really enjoyed it too. I like going deep into these topics and, and you certainly took me there. So thank you. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Airhome.